The next unit of digital art we're going to be looking at is animation, just really straightforward raster based animation. And what's so nice about GIFs, and you see little GIFs here that I use to illustrate the class, is they can be used as icons, they can be used uh, online on web browsers, you can do animated logos, animated motion graphics. They take up very little memory because they're limited to only 256 colors. And the animation script, which means how the computer knows how to play the image and how long to stay on one image before changing to the next sequential image is all built into the file. So there's no external player you need for a GIF animation. If you just load it into a web browser, the web browser is able to decode it and play it and it will loop it as many times as you've told it to loop it, which usually just goes on forever. So we are going to use the compositing skills we've learned so far in our fantasy landscape, in our cartoon jumble, in our um, creature creation, along with some of the, the vector tools and the shape understanding and the use of layers that we've used in exercise two for our emojis to create a short GIF animation that features a transformation. Transformation is the key. Like you see these little basic vector shapes turning into a fish, turning into shapes, turning into horses, a cat. We wanna feature an, a, a transformation with this. So that's our main storytelling goal. We can use PhotoP to do this. In the lab, we're gonna use Photoshop. The only uh, difference for this assignment is that Photoshop has animation tools built into it, whereas PhotoP does not. So there is an external site called gifmaker.me that's in the instructions that you can use to augment for Photoshop's animation tools if you're doing it all from a, a browser remotely outside of the lab. What are we trying to learn? There's a lot of new things to learn beyond just the compositing we've learned. So we really wanna master our organization of raster assets. Assets are anything that that we're using to make our image, right? So we might, if we're gonna animate our creature, we might separate that creature into like a paper doll of features. It's wings on one layer, it's tail on another layer, it's head done in four different expressions so that we can organize those layers and use them to create the poses we need for some form of transformation. We want our transformations to feel like they're not instantaneous. Like it's not that we have a creature and then all of a sudden the creature has wings. We want it to feel like they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that really lends itself to movement. So it's not a strobe light of things appearing. Instead, it's this transition from beginning, middle, to end. In order to make this work believably and in a way that tells your story and communicates clearly, we have to deal with a new notion, which is the timing of how we see images. Animation has to do with movement. Movement is an illusion that happens over time. And because we're just showing still images, but showing them in a sequence that's controlled enough so it looks like it's moving. And this is gonna teach us animation basics, starting with keyframe development and storyboarding, which we're gonna start sketching today. And then when we create a storyboard panel, that is a design for what's called a keyframe. And those are, key moments in the animation. Anything that's not a keyframe is what's called an in-between, and it just connects keyframes and might make them smoother. So we use the keyframe design to really control the story, to control the impact of what we're trying to show. We're gonna look at past examples. Remember, you always have past tutorials to look at, and what you're gonna deliver is assignment three. And assignment three has actual three deliverables to it. The rough storyboard sketch, a GIF animation that's made to run screen resolution, and a refined storyboard that's made to be print resolution showing at least nine frames, nine keyframes based on your initial storyboard. So, 
one requirement of this is not only that you show a transformation, it's that you use some asset that you've already created in the class. This doesn't need to be the only thing you use. You can create new assets. You can definitely uh, bring other images in. But from the, the different assignments we've done so far, your kind of self-portrait avatar we did for exercise zero, our cartoon kind of line art jumble based on a banned book that we did for exercise one, our custom emoji design that we did for exercise two, you can see being animated here. Your fantasy landscape we did for assignment one, your fantasy creature we did for assignment two, or even the combination of both that we did for assignment three, as you see animated here. As long as you're using some asset that you've already created in the class as part of your animation, you have fulfilled that, that part of the assignment. So the first thing we have to do is understand what animation is and what, what aspects it has. So I'm gonna to go to my little digital sketchbook. And before I can do my rough storyboard, animation has three things, three components. The first is some sort of character. Now a character is anything that the audience experiences the story through. So a character does not necessarily mean something with a spine and a smile or a face. I could see a really good animation being made where the character is a paperclip that's on someone's desk. And I don't even mean it's an anthropomorphized paperclip with eyes and that moves around. I just mean it's a, a regular static paperclip and it's on someone's desk. But if it's the thing that we, as the audience follow through an animation, we might be able to experience the transformation of a changing of seasons by looking at how that paperclip shadow changes on the desk. The paperclip is the thing that shows it to us, right? So character is, is how, how the audience experiences the time. Second, there is no such thing as a character without a setting. So Garfield comics very often show Garfield, the character, and Garfield's just on a, a horizontal line. But because we can't have a, a character without a setting, we have to, as the audience, infer and make a creative guess as to what that setting is. And almost always it's Garfield on his kitchen counter, right? Somewhere inside. But what if we see a Garfield panel and all of a sudden Garfield is just surrounded by white, but Garfield has a scarf on? Then even though it looks like there's no setting, we're going to infer and creatively guess that Garfield is outside, maybe in the snow, right? Because of the scarf. So there's always a setting. You just have to decide how much you want to control it as the animator, as the storyteller. And then three, what makes animation different than just making a postcard image or a poster or a pinup is that you need the illusion because it is only an illusion of time passing and in animation we're going to get this illusion of time passing by having sequential images it's the same way film works it's the same way comic books work but the way that animation is different than a comic book is the panel, the format of the image is always the same. It's the size of your screen, right? So we're going to use a square format for our storyboarding and for our animations. It just makes things easier and more uniform. And this is what animators always have to deal with because they're either making animation for a computer screen or for a TV screen or for a movie screen. Right? And all of those are set rectangular formats. So to do my rough storyboard sketch, I want each of you to show your transformation in nine keyframes, which gives us three squares in a grid of three. So three on three. And I want you to leave some space in between those squares. That's called the gutter. Because in those gutters, 
we can put little notes. Rough storyboard sketches do not need to be very clean. And it doesn't make sense to spend a lot of time drawing detail here. Instead, they're just showing us our ideas and we might need to erase and change them. Why I do three on three is we're trying to show a transformation, right? And it's only a transformation if we have beginning, middle, and end clearly shown. So these first three, we're going to show the beginning. The second three, we're going to show the middle, the transition. The last three, we're going to show the end and the consequence. And if we're really thinking about it, really kind of lucky and thoughtful, we might be able to make it loop and set to reset. So that by the time we get to the end of our animation, it's ready to go back to the first panel again. So it plays through and it all makes sense. I have to first identify my character. So I need to use something that I've created so far this semester. I go to my files. What have I created? I've created a fantasy creature. I've created a fantasy landscape. I put them into a, a setting believably together. I created a little avatar image for myself based on Legos and Voltron. I created a line art jumble, you know, a composite about the book Speak. I've created an emoji about that same banned book. And it would not be enough to just take this emoji, this is kind of my finished composition with it, and to then make the background rotate or pulsate or something. That would be an animation, but it wouldn't be a transformation, right? So when you're looking at the work you've done, I want you to think, how can you use it to transform? How can it, it transform itself, or how can it be part of something else transforming? And you can blend them together. So here is a professional example. This is something I did recently. It's for a podcast about something not all that interesting to most people. It's about international shipping and logistics. And the podcast is called Ship Happens. So it has a fun pun to it. So just like we did our emoji, it started as a static logo design for their branding and their podcast. And then I did a color version. Oh, that's pretty standard for identity and branding design. And then I put it onto settings and added more color. So shipping during the day, shipping at night, right? And what's nice about that is even though I want the logo to be static, and even though the logo looks kind of dynamic and it has this little crane that could be lifting this box off the eye and onto the ship, I didn't want to animate that because it, it interferes with the logo type. It interferes with how it's read. But this gives me a, a transformation opportunity, which is always more fun. So if I wanted an animated logo, what could I do? And so what I ended up doing was just animating it as a transformation from day to night. So in order to transform between the day and night, I didn't want it to just instantly blink, you know, from one image to the other. These were my assets, right? I wanted to build a way to, to have beginning, middle, and end. So it only lasts 17 seconds, but I used these kind of rotating sun rays to kind of symbolize sunrise and sunset 